So I'm going to break down the talk into two parts. In the beginning, I'm going to talk about um, sort of why I got into cancer genomics as a clinician, what was my motivation to do that, um, talk a bit about an effort that we put together, which you heard about briefly there, um, called the Extraordinary Responder Initiative, where we take patients who've had outlier responses to cancer therapies and then try to take a whole genome view as to why um, those responses happened in those particular individuals and then talk to you about how we're using that information to try to prospectively improve the care of the patients um, that we see in the clinic. And so what my research focus has been over the last 20 years is to try to accelerate the discovery of, of new cancer drugs. I was really motivated to go into um, cancer research based upon an experience uh, my aunt had with a pretty difficult course uh, with breast cancer at the time. Um, there really weren't effective therapies available for her type of cancer. Um, she received a lot of nonspecific chemotherapies, which in the end were not very effective. And it, at least to me, the, the way to um, make the biggest impact was not necessarily to go into the clinic and wait for things to come to me in terms of new treatments, but was to go into the lab and try to work on that boundary between the clinic um, and the laboratory. So what we try to do um, is called precision medicine. Um, it's not kind of self-explanatory, but we try to identify drug targets. Um, I'll spend the first 10 or 15 minutes talking about how we identify these targets, but these are typically things that are mutated in the cancer cells that are making the cancer grow or progress. It's why you got the cancer and what's making it grow. Um, what most of the institution is doing at Memorial is actually trying to identify drugs um, that specifically inhibit these targets. And I don't have a lot of time today to really talk about how we do that, but that's a big part of what we do at the center. But the real challenge has been, and, and really what I've worked on for the past decade or so, is how do we identify the individual patients who have a mutation in a particular target so that they, we can match those patients up with, with the right drug? <laughs> we all have that same rigor, don't worry about it. So there's two ways that we um, define these targets. Um, one is called a genotype uh, to phenotype approach. And th this is really a big data approach to identify something important. And, and so this is really best exemplified by efforts like the Tumor Cancer Genome Atlas. This is a large consortium of, of scientists who are taking thousands of tumors, um, applying the, the most recently developed genetic analysis techniques, which generate you know, thousands and millions of data points, and then use statistics to try to figure out what in the population is most commonly mutated. And the fact that it's commonly mutated again and again in individual patients recurrently um, in multiple people kind of implies that it must be important. It must be selected for. And by using this technique, we've identified a whole bunch of mutated proteins like BRAF, KIT, ALK, that have proven to be mutated what are called oncogenes. These are proteins that are altered, that are activated in the cancer cell that are making the cancer cell grow. And it was really one of these type of stories that really changed my career. I was uh, working in a laboratory at Memorial, um, a guy named Neil Rosen. We were working on uh, chaperone function. Um, I was also a medical oncologist seeing patients, hadn't yet gotten my own lab. Um, when this paper came out from a, a group in the UK at the Sanger Institute, um, showing that, that BRAF was mutated in human tumors. And it was a pretty simple experiment that they did. They just took 1,000 cancer samples. They sequenced all the genes in a single pathway, the MAP kinase pathway, and we already knew that there was a gene in that pathway called RAS that was very commonly mutated. So in a worst case scenario, it was a pretty low risk experiment. They were gonna at least define where RAS was mutated better um, in human tumors. But by doing it in sort of a non-biased way, using all the genes in the pathway, analyzing all the genes in the pathway, they uncovered that, that BRAF was mutating about 8% of cancers. Nobody knew that going into this experiment. And there was one uh, gene, uh, one mutation within that gene, initially labeled B599E. Uh, it's actually um, one off from the correct amino acid. They actually counted wrong in the original na Nature paper. Um, and then everything had to go back and cor correct about three years worth of literature. But that single mutation, um, was present in about 90 plus percent of the patients that had an individual BRAF mutation. So when you see that kind of recurrence again and again, and actually 50% of melanomas have that exact same BRAF mutation, you know that's gotta be important. And essentially, when this paper came out, I pretty much went into Neil's office the next day and said, I'd love to work on this BRAF thing. I think this is really a target that if we had a good drug that could inhibit this target, we could make an impact in the patients. <laughs> And so the initial experiment we did is we just took a panel of cell lines that we could grow in, in plastic dishes um, in the laboratory and we genotyped these for whether they had a BRAF mutation and we had a group of those, whether they had RAS mutations, which is the protein right upstream of, of BRAF, um, 
or whether they were, had activation in the pathway due to things upstream like an EGFR amplification or another RTK on the surface that was activating um, this MAP kinase pathway. And what was notable at the time, this was back in 2002, is that we didn't have the capability of, at Sloan Kettering to actually efficiently figure out which cell lines had these mutations. This is just one mutation we were looking for in one exon of one gene, but that was actually a very labor-intensive process if you didn't have this new technology called Sanger sequencing, and these were big machines that cost about a million dollars. And so I actually remember still going down Second Avenue in a taxi with a, a collection of cell lines to NYU because I had a friend there who had just gotten this big Sanger machine, and she was willing to genotype um, these cells for us, which would really allow us to do the experiment. And that really hit it home to me that if we were going to study this kind of biology, we had to be able to do this type of genetic testing, not just in cell lines in, in, in the lab, but we had to be able to do this in people if we were ever going to you know, bring the things we were learning in the laboratory um, forward into patients. But just what did this experiment actually show is ultimately pub published in Nature, that if you had a BRAF mutation, you really were dependent upon um, this MAP kinase pathway, whereas if you had a RAS mutation, which is one step upstream, there's other pathways that are activated by RAS other than RAF and MEK, and they're thus less sensitive, and if you were, had an activation uh, further upstream from that, you were, you were further resistant. So this gave us confidence that if we had a good inhibitor of this pathway, that that would be a good drug, and we just needed to be able to find which patients had BRAF mutations and then test that drug. And just to make a long story short, it took us about eight more years, but eventually we were able to find a good drug that inhibit this RAF protein, bring it into the clinic, and then we started to see these incredible responses. Um, this is a PET scan in a patient with melanoma. This is all disease. After 15 days of taking this pill, um, you can see this patient went on to have a complete response. And these type of treatments uh, responses were pretty much unheard of in melanoma. Um, going into this clinical trial, the average response um, of a melanoma patient to any known drug was probably less than 5% and the average survival of those patients was less than a year. Um, and this drug ultimately showed that it could make people live longer, had a very high response rate of about 70% in melanoma patients. So that's one way to identify these drug targets. Again, statistically, big data, um, that continues to go on. There's now a, 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 an effort called ICGC, which is an international effort to sequence even more tumors, to pick up even rare mutations that we haven't identified yet. But if you're running a small research laboratory, R01 funded, um, you know, you're not going to have hundreds of millions of dollars from one of these consortium to do those type of efforts. You have to be a little bit more intelligent um, as to how you're going to identify these drug targets, maybe a little smarter using the resources you had. And so my lab has really pioneered this opposite approach, which is called phenotype to genotype. And this is where we take patients that have already responded to a drug, but maybe it was a drug that otherwise failed in that cancer type. So maybe 20 patients were on the clinical trial, only one of them responded. And so in 19 out of 20, it didn't work, kind of a failure there. But if that one patient had a dramatic response and lived much longer, then if we could figure out what made that patient unique, maybe we already have a drug, it's sitting on the shelf, we just need to know where to uh, repurpose it, um, how to apply it. And so the first uh, case we really uh, tackled was, was from this clinical trial of a drug called Everolimus. Everolimus is a, a selective inhibitor um, of, a drug, of a target called mTOR. Um, and mTOR is a pathway uh, that's very commonly activated um, in human cancers, and this drug had already been approved in kidney cancer, and we were studying in bladder cancer. And, you know, unfortunately, the, the rationale for studying it for bladder cancer was not really strong. Pretty much it was that, you know, this, work, this, this drug works in kidney, the bladder's kind of near the kidney, maybe it'll work in bladder. I mean, that's really, you know, was the scientific rationale going into the study, and that's unfortunately the scientific rationale of many of the drugs um, that we're studying. And, and we ultimately put 45 patients onto this trial. Um, only two of them responded. And so statistically, this was a disappointing result. This was a negative study. But these two responders really, you know, got us intrigued that that they weren't just transient responses, short-lived, you know, small responses. They were major responses in those patients. So even though it didn't seem that Everolimus was great for bladder cancer in general, maybe for a subset of patients, um, this would really work well. We just didn't understand at the time who those patients would be. And I just want to highlight one of them because she really highlights the type of story we're talking about. So this was a woman, who was, she was in her young 70s at the time, um, early 70s, and, and um, she presented with, with new onset bladder cancer. And the bladder cancer had already spread to her lymph nodes, and, and so it was already metastatic. And so what we try to do in those cases is we give those patients chemotherapy, we try to shrink the cancer down, and then the surgeon goes in and sort of cuts everything out. They cut out the bladder entirety. 
Um, you get sort of a diversion. They do a lymph node dissection, taking out a whole bunch of the lymph nodes. And so that, this woman underwent that, that radical surgery. Um, and then in the fall of 2009, she was still cancer-free. They did a CAT scan, and everything looked okay. But unfortunately, by January 2010, her cancer had come back. And so these red arrows are pointing to these big tumors here in her belly that are not supposed to be here. And so in a patient back in 2010 who's had chemotherapy and the cancers come back, the average survival of these patients is about nine months. And so we knew other treatments wouldn't be effective in this situation. We would encourage those patients to go on clinical trials. And even though there wasn't a very strong rationale for this trial, scientifically, it was a trial we had open at the institution. Um, this woman went on, and even though almost none of the patients responded, um, within three months, she had a partial response. Within six months, she had a complete response, and that was 2010. July 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, she's continued to have a complete response. Over now seven years in a complete response. This woman was actually uh, profiled in a New York Times article about a year and a half ago about these extraordinary responders that we're trying to study and figure out what makes them unique. And so we wanted to ask that question. We wanted to say, you know, is there some genetic, you know, property in this patient? Does she have a specific type of mutation that makes her sensitive to this drug? And so we used the technology we had at the time. We did um, Sanger sequencing, which was then pretty available and common um, for about 10 genes. We didn't find any mutations. Um, we did this sequinome assay, which was a mass spec approach to look for hotspot mutations in about 60 genes. Again, she had no mutations whatsoever by that assay. Um, we did a, an array approach, um, looking at array CGH across the genome, looking for copy number alterations, amplifications, or deletions that could explain this. She had a very flat genome. We didn't see any copy number alterations of significance. Um, so we're thinking she's got a, probably a very low mutation rate tumor. There's got to be something there. We just don't know what it is, and we're never going to be able to figure it out. But luckily, technology advanced, and, and there was a new technology coming out called next-gen sequencing which was really holding the promise of being able to, instead of sequence a, a single gene or analyze a single exon, we could look at the, the entire genome um, at the same time. And so we actually did that. Um, this was actually the first whole cancer genome ever performed at, at Sloan Kettering. Um, and even though we went in thinking this would be a low mutation rate tumor, there wouldn't be a lot of mutations, it turns out that she had 17,000 somatic mutations. A somatic mutation is a mutation that's present in the tumor but not in the normal cells from that patient and we had simply missed them all. And you say, well, if you've got 17,000 mutations, how in the world would you ever know which of those is actually important and is causing this response? But it's a real testament to how much we've learned from the Human Cancer Genome Project, which had been completed you know, earlier this century, and then the, the, the other genomic sequencing efforts that have been done in, retrospectively over, the, over the, the next decade that followed, um, and just really advances in computational methods and computers that we're able to map all of these mutations, all 17,000, to the reference human genome, ask which of these mutations are located within genes versus sort of the, the junk that's in between, which of them are located in the coding regions and the exons of genes, which of them which, um, when you change the mutation, when you change the protein in that way, would it cause um, some sort of alteration which would potentially change the function? And then which of those where you might change the function of a protein, um, would it be in a pathway that could have anything to do with Everolimus? And if you sort of do that whole analysis, it comes down to just two genes, one on chromosome 22, one on chromosome 9, um, one TSC1, one NF2. And the reason these are notable is that if you inactivate each of these genes, you activate um, TORC1, which is the direct target of Everolimus. So in retrospect, this woman was the perfect candidate for this drug. We randomly put her on the drug. We weren't smart, it was just luck. Um, but one could imagine that if we had this knowledge and we had the ability to genetically test our patients prospectively, maybe we would do the trials a bit more rationally um, going forward. So we've now applied this you know, to other cases. I'll just, just mention two real quickly. Um, this is a woman uh, with low-grade serous ovarian cancer. Um, there is no systemic therapy for this type of cancer. Um, usually what happens is we try to do surgery. If the surgery eventually fails, these women die of, of starvation because you develop bowel obstruction. Um, even though there's no effective chemotherapy, this woman had received three chemotherapies already, none of which worked. And for no particular reason, other than it was study, a study open at the time, this is back in 2009, um, she was put on this gynecologic oncology group study. This is a cooperative national group um, that studies ovarian cancers um, and given this drug AZD6244, which is still not even FDA approved. This drug, even eight years into this, is, is not an FDA approved drug. This is an inhibitor of a, a protein called MEK1. And the trial was disappointing. There were about 10 responders on the trial. 
out of about 70-something patients. That was below what they were hoping for um, to move the drug uh, forward. There was only one complete response, and it was actually this woman. Within a year, she had achieved a complete response, and this is an old slide. It's now been over eight years. She's now been a complete response on this drug. This woman uh, is in her like, late 60s when she started, so eight years later, maybe she's now in her 70s. Yeah. So again, even though it was a disappointing drug in most patients, it really worked in this patient. So we were able to get a hold of her tumor. We applied this next-gen sequencing analysis where we can look at thousands of genes at the same time. And it turned out that she had a very interesting deletion, 15 amino uh, base pair deletion, which caused a 15 amino acid uh, deletion within the protein in a gene called MAP2K1. And you say, well, what's MAP2K1? Well, MAP2K1 is the gene that encodes for MEK1, which is the target of the drug. So in retrospect, what I love about these extraordinary responders, it's always obvious in retrospect. Oh, well, that's obvious. That's why she responded. Nobody has any idea going in. And it just, you know, we just, and in some ways it's a technology, uh, you know, improvements that just allow us to, to solve these cases where we couldn't in the past. So what does this deletion do? This deletion is actually located in a region of the protein called the negative regulatory helix. This part of the protein folds over onto the enzymatic portion of the kinase and locks it into an inactive conformation. When you get this deletion, it sort of opens up the protein so that it's turned on all the time. Um, and that's why the pathway is always activated. The cancer is always growing. Um, and so if you inhibit that protein, um, it's effective against the cancer. We always, for these experiments, go back to the lab in terms of the biology and actually validate these hypotheses from the genetics. And we, this is uh, just showing that we made this mutation functionally in the lab, made a protein with this exact deletion, put it into cells. And when you do that, you get constitutive activation of this uh, protein called ERK, which is the downstream target of MEK. So this mutation is biologically proven to be functional. I actually have a postdoc now, as, and I'll talk to you about our prospective initiative in a second, who every time we now find a MEK1 mutation in a patient with cancer, that postdoc goes on and makes that uh, individual mutation. And you can see that some of these mutations activate ERK, others don't do anything. We, we call these drivers, um, these are called passengers. So they are real mutations. They are present in the tumor. Um, the you know, tumor has a different mutated sequence of this gene than the wild type um, cells, the normal cells, um, but they're not activating, uh, they're not doing anything, they're just passengers. And actually, the vast majority of mutations we find in patients with cancer are just inert passengers. And one of the key challenges computationally for us going forward is to be able to separate these drivers um, from passengers so we know what's important um, for any individual. I'll just mention one more of these cases. This was a, a woman in her uh, 40s um, when she initially presented, two young kids. Um, she presented with a tumor in her ureter. So the ureter is the tube that goes from the kidney to the bladder, brings the urine down there. Ureteral tumors are kind of rare. The surgeons went in, they cut out the tumor. They looked at it under the microscope, and it turned out that she had a small cell cancer of the ureter. And, and this is a pretty rare cancer. Uh, we had a series of about 70 of them at Sloan Kettering over the course of about 15 years. And if you looked back in that series, all 70 of those patients had died. So this was a bad cancer to have. And so given that, that history, even though she was cancer-free at the time, they gave her chemotherapy to try to prevent the cancer from coming back. But unfortunately, just a few months later, the cancer came back. It was now in her kidneys. It was in her lymph nodes. Not really sure why they did it, because it was never going to work. They actually cut out her kidney, cut out her lymph nodes, hoping that that would cure her cancer. But just a few months later, the cancer came back again. And it was again in the lymph nodes, and it was now in the bone. And so you've got a woman, young 40s, two young kids, cancer that everybody dies of, um, no effective treatments known. What do you do with such a patient? Well, we refer to the phase one clinic. The phase one clinic is where we test new drugs. Maybe we'll get lucky with a new drug. We don't even know what dose to give, what schedule to give. And so she was referred to that clinic and she was put on this combination of two drugs. One, a chemotherapy called irinotecan, another drug called AZD7762. This was an inhibitor of a pathway, a, a kinase called CHECK1. And so what CHECK1 does is it prevents cells that have DNA damage from moving from the uh, you know, G1 phase of the cell cycle to the DNA S phase of the cycle where the DNA gets uh, synthesized. And the hypothesis for this combination was that the chemo would induce DNA damage in the cancer cells and some normal cells, but the normal cells would have an intact you know, P53 pathway and other checkpoints um, and would be able to sort of arrest the cell, fix the DNA you know, problems and, uh, and correct it, whereas the tumor cells would have a disrupted checkpoint 
they would move into this DNA synthesis phase, and then because there was this abnormal DNA in, that, in, the, in those cells, the cells would go on to die. And it was not an unreasonable hypothesis, but it was a very negative study. They treated uh, about three or four dozen patients on the study. They saw a lot more side effects than they expected. They weren't really seeing any activity. So the company AstraZeneca just killed the program. They just ended the whole development of the drug. Even though this patient, who had a cancer that never responds to anything, had actually gone on to have a complete response to the treatment. Um, and since they killed the program, we had to stop the experimental drug after about three months. We continued the chemo for a few months, presuming that when we stopped the chemo, the cancer would come back. And that was about five years ago, and she's actually cured. So this is a woman who's cured on a, on a, on a cancer drug that was so disappointing in, in the initial phase of study um, that the company killed the program. Maybe if we could figure out what made her unique, we could develop other drugs like this drug um, in similar uh, types of patients. And so we sequenced her whole genome again. This time we found 19,000 mutations in her tumor, a lot more structural alterations in the genome, so a lot more translocations. It's where you take two parts of the genome and sort of stick them together, cause a fusion, a lot more copy number alterations, so gains or losses at different parts um, of the genome. And I don't have really a lot of time to talk about how we sort of prioritize these mutations, but just to give you a little insight, um, again, we know where these genes now lie in certain uh, in certain proteins, these mutations are in certain proteins. Um, we can sort of estimate what the change in the protein would be. And there were two mutations in proteins that would relate to this checkpoint pathway that we thought were interesting after that computational analysis, one in this protein called RAT50, one in a protein called ATR. And the reason we chose to then functionally validate this RAD50 mutation is that this mutation was located in a known functional region of the protein called the D-loop. And if you look at the D-loop throughout evolution, it's really identical. So the D-loop in humans is the same as the D-loop in mouse, is the same as D-loop in, Dros in Drosophila, the same as in you know, worms, is the same as yeast, as the same in bacteria. And when you see that type of evolutionary conservation, you know a mutation in that region is probably gonna cause an activation of the protein. This would have been an interesting gene to have a mutation in terms of sensitivity to this drug, but the mutation was in no known functional dom domain where it was located, there was no evolutionary conservation, so that allowed us to sort of prioritize this mutation over another, and we've sort of come up with methods to do this very quickly with hundreds of genes at the same time um, to sort of give the biologists an idea of what they should focus on um, in the lab. So we also then took advantage of this cross-species uh, sort of conservation to validate the functionality of this mutation by knocking it into yeast. And we did this in collaboration with uh, John Petrini, who's one of the uh, laboratory scientists at Memorial. And so again, this is published, so just to make a long story short, if you take uh, wild-type yeast and give them the chemotherapy, this is their sensitivity to that drug. If you knock in this mutation, you make it about 50-fold more sensitive. Um, but that's not that impressive, given the fact this patient was cured um, you know, with this combination chemotherapy. But remember, she didn't just get the chemotherapy in the setting of having the mutation. She also got the CHECK1 inhibitor. And so to model the CHECK1 inhibitor, we actually knocked out that pathway in these yeasts. And when you do that, you see this, what's called synthetic lethal interaction between having this RAD50 mutation and activating the CHECK1 pathway and giving the chemotherapy. So again, in retrospect, this woman was the perfect candidate for this exact combination of drugs. We just didn't know that going into the trial because we didn't know her genetics. But if we knew the genetics, maybe we would have done this type of trial a little bit more rationally. So this is sort of the paradigm of this. We take these responders that, have, um, that are outliers in the population. We take some of their tumors. We do genetics. We identify some mutations we think are maybe important. We go back to the lab. We do some functional validation based upon that hypothesis. But what we needed is we needed an assay that would allow us to look for these mutations in hundreds of genes at the same time very quickly and at low cost so that we could then do in iterative clinical trials where we find you know, 100 patients with that MEK1 mutation, put them on a clinical trial and ask how many of them respond to the drug. And so that was really the impetus for developing this Kravis Center for Molecular Oncology. And the goal of the Kravis Center is pretty simple. We want to define the molecular driver. Again, what's the mutation making the cancer grow in every single patient that comes to our institution? We want to use that information to facilitate enrollment onto clinical trials. And because we, and I'll mention this, and I'll show you this in a second, because we analyze both the tumor DNA and the normal DNA, we can also, as, a, as sort of a byproduct of this, identify germline variants, things that, that are in all your cells um, that, that cause an, an increased horrible risk of getting the cancer in the first place. And we've actually found that a lot of these cancers are not random. 
patients really had a, a risk uh, for that particular cancer um, going in. And so the assay we developed is called MSK Impact. We actually got FDA authorization. Um, it's the first academic center to, to get that um, in the country. And the key to this is just to keep the cost down. We want to analyze as many genes as possible for the lowest possible cost um, so we can sequence the most patients possible um, to kind of accelerate development of these drugs as quickly as possible. So we take DNA from the tumor, we take DNA from the normal cells, usually from blood, and then instead of sequencing the whole genome, which would take a lot of time and a lot of money, um, we capture the parts of the genome we care most about um, by developing these baits that are biotinylated, they hybridize with the parts of the DNA we care about, and then we use beads to sort of pull down the parts of the DNA we care about, wash the rest away, and then sequence that um, usually in, using an Illumina-based technology uh, called uh, HiSeq or, or NovaSeq, and then use uh, powerful informatic methodologies to figure out for all the DNA we sequence, because it's very small, tiny fragments, which DNA molecule came from which patient, where is it located in the genome, um, is it from the tumor, is it from the normal, um, and then ask, you know, which, what are the mutations in that individual. Um, to be able to do this initiative, um, one of the main limitations is money, um, because this type of genetic analysis, even though it's been shown in a lot of instances to really help a lot of patients, it's still not reimbursed for many cancers. So we can sort of bill somewhat for this uh, type of work in lung cancer and colorectal and melanoma, because in those cancers, there is a specific gene mutation that will dictate what treatment you get. So for example, in melanoma, I showed you that BRAF story. If you have a BRAF mutation, you get the BRAF inhibitor. If you're BRAF wild type, you don't. And so at least testing for BRAF, one single gene, is somewhat reimbursable, but not necessarily testing for as many um, as we're testing for. So to be able to do this assay, to be able to do it on everybody, we actually had to write a clinical trial, which is called 12245. This allows us to do this genetic testing prospectively, report the results back to the patients, um, and then also use any leftover material for further discovery efforts, whole genome, exome, transcriptome um, going forward. I think one of the things that has been special about our initiative is that nobody, um, no individual sort of scientist or clinician owns this data. It's, it's a real shared resource. So whether you're Crank Thompson, our CEO, or um, you work in the cafeteria, or the new medical student, it doesn't matter. Everybody has access to this data in real time. We actually um, deposit all of it into this, what's called the CBIO portal for cancer genomics, which is sort of a way that non-informaticians can sort of browse the data very easily. Um, and everybody with an MSKCC logon and email password um, gets access to this data. So I took this screenshot about two weeks ago. At that point, we had sequenced 22,400 tumors from over 20,000 patients, and we're now sequencing over 800 patients a month, and this is rapidly you know, uh, expanding in size. Um, this is what it would look like for an individual patient. This is a 37-year-old with breast cancer, a hormone uh, positive disease. Um, she's now recurred about a month ago, um, 31 months since her initial diagnosis. She's got three or four mutations we identified in her tumor, couple copy number alterations. One of these mutations is a hotspot. That's what this little flame means in, 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 in the portal. Um, E17K is the specific protein change, and I'll get back a little bit later as to how this uh, particular mutation um, is important. So that's how we're, we're sequencing the tumors to identify these mutations. We also had to come up with new ways to do clinical trials uh, in this era of sort of precision medicine where we're identifying these specific mutations. And the concept we've really pushed um, are, are what, call, what are called basket studies. So the traditional way you would do these type of clinical trials is you would do a trial in breast cancer and a separate trial in lung cancer and a separate trial in colon cancer. And so you'd have to do a lot of different trials against the same drug for the same mutation. Um, it was pretty inefficient. And for some of these cancers, especially rare cancers, there wouldn't be enough patients to kind of open up you know, the, their own trial. And so the drugs wouldn't even be tested in, in rare cancer types. And so we came up with the idea is, is instead of centering the trial around a specific you know, cancer type, centered around a specific mutation. And this is a, a, a trial I run of a drug called Neratinib, which was actually abandoned uh, by one of the big pharma groups um, and then repurposed by a company with us um, to test this hypothesis that if you had a HER2 mutation, and that's the protein that Neratinib uh, inhibits, you know, would it work um, in that tumor type? And then would it work differently as a fun function of which type of cancer um, you have? And I'll just show some of the data from this uh, trial. Um, this this paper is in press in Nature. Um, from this trial. Um, this was a woman with, with breast cancer. Um, she had had eight prior um, chemotherapies to date. She's got widespread metastatic disease. Um, 
she has what's called HER2 normal cancer. And so we've known for a long time that HER2 amplification is a good drug target. There's some drugs on the market for that, but she doesn't have drug ampl she doesn't have tumor, uh, uh, gene amplification. She doesn't have protein overexpression, but she's got a mutation, V77L is the protein change within the enzymatic kinase domain portion of that um, gene. She was given the drug in July 2014. You can see this massive amount of disease. By two months later, she had gone on to have a complete response. And so what is novel here um, is not necessarily even the biology. We've known that this target, HER2, has been important for many years. Um, but what is novel is that we're actually able to now sequence these tumors, identify these mutations, which is a whole other class of patients who may respond to these drugs. But even though this response here was three years ago, it's still true that in the United States, in New York, if you go to most doctors here in New York City as a, a patient with end-stage breast cancer and ask, are you gonna test my tumor for HER2 mutations? The answer is gonna be no, because you can't get reimbursed for HER2 testing in, in patients with breast cancer. So it becomes a chicken and the egg problem. How do you show a drug like this works until you've identified enough patients with the mutation and tested them with the drug? But how do you find those patients when we're not allowed to test for them? And how do you justify the testing until you have a drug um, that works in that, in that mutation subpopulation? And so we've just tried to break that chicken and the egg cycle by just testing everybody for free, driving enrollment onto these clinical trials, which then we hope will change the standard of care um, much quicker. Um, I think what are the advantages of this type of approach? It, 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 it's, it's a great thing um, for a biologist who also sees patients. There's probably nothing more frustrating than being a laboratory scientist working on something for a decade, having a great hypothesis, making progress, thinking that your, your, your new approach is gonna work and then having it not tested in patients in any sort of rational well, way. So what these basket studies really allow us to do is test a lot of biologic hypotheses around these drug mutation combinations. So you know, will patients with HER2 mutations respond? Does lineage matter? Does it matter what can, kind of cancer type it, it is? Does it matter what the specific mutation is within the tumor? Not all the mutations are necessarily the same within a particular protein. Um, we can collect tissue and figure out why some patients responded better than others, even though they're the same cancer type and the same mutation. And we can, for unknown mutations, do this co-clinical trial concept where we put the patient on the drug, then we actually make the mutation in the lab, and then see if the mutation has got similar sensitivity to what happened to the patient, um, both in the lab as well as um, in the clinic. So here's just some brief um, data about that particular trial. Um, what we found is that even though these mutations are found in lots of different cancer types, patients with breast cancer, and this is called a, what's called a waterfall plot, if it goes all the way down to minus 100, that means they had a complete response. If it's going up, it means they didn't respond at all, and then there's things in between. Um, you saw a lot more responses in, in the breast cancer patients than, say, lung cancer and patients with colorectal cancer who had these particular mutations. Again, the mutations are the same gene. Um, the colorectal cancer patients didn't respond at all. And so it does matter what tumor type you have because probably the environment that that mutation is present, what other co-mutations are present, or other lineage or developmental specific patterns um, of, 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 uh, within the cell actually influence the drug response as well. And then if you actually look at the, the actual type of mutation, whether it's an extracellular mutation, or, or an insertion or a kinase domain hotspot, um, you see variable response as well, um, where the hotspots are probably the most sensitive and probably suggest that we need to make better drugs against some of these mutations. They don't all bind with the same affinity, and for some of them, we may need to develop um, novel therapies. Um, what this actually shows is that if, if the mutation is subclonal, um, which is defined as it's not present in every single one of the cancer cells, the drug doesn't work very well. And so if not every cancer cell has the mutation you're targeting, what probably happens is very quickly the cells without the mutation that are being driven by something else very quickly grow out and the patient becomes resistant. Seems obvious, it actually never been shown in patients um, with this type of, of therapy in the past. So this is, I, I think, allowed us to do these trials much more efficiently, much faster. Um, what have the challenges been? Um, so one criticism we get, you know, I think this has gotten better from clinicians and companies and um, regulators is, is while the mutation may predict for response to this drug, there may be other things that also predict for response, and if you only test the patients with the mutation, you're going to miss those other things. And while that's true, it's not what we're testing with this trial, um, and if you try to use the unselected populations, you usually end up with nothing. Um, I call it the sad fact, which is getting multiple disease teams to work together is a challenge. The way our academic center is organized is very disease-focused. 
And the lung cancer doctors are not used to working with the breast cancer doctors and the colon cancer doctors, and they're all looking for academic credit. And it's been hard sometimes to bring them together as a team um, for the benefit of the patients. And then really the primary hurdle has been identifying the patients. Most are still not getting tested um, in this country. And sometimes they combine the screening protocol to test for the mutations with the drug. And what you don't want is, is because the patient was screened using money from Pfizer, they can only go on a Pfizer drug. You know, that, that would be ridiculous. So, um, so this has been hard to do because the doctors are always looking for a way to pay for this testing. And by linking it to a specific trial, um, that has some negative uh, uh, connotations as well. So by, by doing the testing essentially in everyone for free, um, we've been able to accelerate enrollment onto these studies. Um, it's gotten to the point where one of the problems we're having is we're the only ones enrolling people onto this study. There's nobody else in the country who's doing this to scale. Um, and so when we enroll people on, for example, this, this basket study of neratinib, we had put about 70 patients on the study and the other institutions were, were lagging behind and that's, that's slowing things down as well. Um, I think it's best highlighted by this trial of, of a drug uh, that inhibited a protein called AKT, which I mentioned in that breast cancer patient I had shown you the profile a little bit earlier. Um, that's a very commonly activated pathway, but AKT mutations are very rare. They're not found with greater than one or 2% in any cancer type. So there are about 1% of breast cases have these, 1% of lung cancers, 1% of prostate. So it's rare, but, but present in a lot of different cancers. And there was a trial of this basket study that had been open um, for about a year, and they had only enrolled seven patients on the study because they weren't routinely doing testing in most patients, so they weren't finding the patients. And they were going to give up on the study, um, and we then came on as the, the 21st institution. There were 20 institutions put seven patients on in a year. We came on as the 21st institution. We had already found 100 patients by that point with this specific mutation. Um, we enrolled 24 patients in the first month. Um, and you ask, would it have mattered if this drug had failed due to lack of accrual? I would say yes. This is actually a patient from that study from our institution where she's got an E17K AKT mutant ER positive breast cancer. Her cancer had actually spread to many places, but, but one place was the eye, um, to the conjunctiva of her eye, which was giving her blurry vision and obviously this cosmetic issue. Um, and so this is a pill. You take it once a day. Um, this is day before she, the day one when she first uh, took the drug. This is day 11. Um, this is day 22. So she went on to receive, uh, to achieve a complete response with this drug after receiving, receiving it for, for a month. Um, and so, again, the problem here has not always been understanding the biology. The problem has been how do you find the patients? How do you test them? How do you know what's important? Sometimes we see multiple mutations in the same tumor. We don't know which ones are functional. We don't know which ones are best to target. That's what we're trying to figure out now with big data going forward. So that's where we've been. I just want to sort of give a little bit of uh, sort of foresight of where we're going over the next uh, 15 minutes or, or so. We're trying to expand the population. Um, we're trying to enhance the platform to look for more things. Um, I mentioned yeah, a, a project called Cancer of Unknown Driver, um, this outreach effort called Make an Impact, and then this use of a, a technology called cell-free DNA, where instead of looking at the tumor DNA, we're actually collecting tumor DNA from the plasma. And so one of the main focuses of our initial effort has been in patients with advanced metastatic cancers. Obviously, those are the patients at greatest need. Their cancers have come back. They've spread. They urgently need new therapies. But probably the place where we can make the greatest impact with these newer therapies is in more recently diagnosed patients where they have local disease, maybe microscopic metastatic disease, but where additional treatment in that setting could cure them and prevent the cancer from coming back. And so this was actually an analysis that we did um, um, where we took patients who got uh, chemotherapy for bladder cancer. You, you heard that earlier when they have sort of locally advanced bladder cancer. We give them chemotherapy, try to shrink the cancer down, and then try to cure them with surgery. And what we asked in this genetic analysis uh, where we did whole exome sequencing of a collection of tumors was, is there a mutation that predicts who's going to respond to that chemotherapy or not? And in that analysis, we found a specific gene called ERCC2, which was mutated at very high rate in patients who had a complete response to the drugs, the chemo, um, but almost never or never uh, when, when they didn't respond um, at all. And this made sense biologically because this, this uh, mutation's in actually a pathway called the NER pathway, which is important for nucleoscission um, repair. So um, it's not surprising that, that a mutation in this uh, gene would actually sensitize you to chemotherapy. 
But the question is, how do you move this now forward? And, and the way we're moving it forward is we're going to do a clinical trial where patients with recently diagnosed bladder cancer um, will have their tumor initially taken out through a cystoscopy, um, which is an endoscopic procedure. Then they'll get the chemotherapy. And while they're getting the chemotherapy, we're going to do the genetic testing to see if they have these ERCC2 mutations. And if they have the ERCC2 mutations and they respond well to the chemotherapy, instead of cutting out their whole bladder in a very you know, debilitating type of procedure, um, we're just going to do that local surgery that they've already had and go with the chemotherapy alone in a bladder sparing approach. So the question is, will these genetics be able to tell us who doesn't need so much treatment? Are we over-treating some of these patients and can we get away with less, cause less morbidity um, in that population? So, so this is not necessarily testing patients trying to prove their outcome, but trying to prove their outcome in the sense that, that they're gonna have less toxicity um, from the treatment. There's other scenarios that we're doing where maybe additional therapy would, would reduce the risk of recurrence um, within that population. Um, we're going to continue to add new genes, and I'll mention that with the cancer of unknown driver effort. Um, but one of the big efforts in our next version of the assay is we're going to actually add probes that will target uh, and try to capture not human DNA, but, but viral sequence um, DNA. And this is another one of these extraordinary responders that we analyzed. This was a, a patient with a gastric cancer who got immunotherapy, and so this is a new class of drugs where you stimulate the immune system to attack the cancer. And it turned out that this was the only patient in the entire cohort of gastric cancer patients who had an EBV-driven tumor, and that was picked up by, by FISH. And this makes sense because we've seen in other contexts, in other diseases like head and neck cancer, Merkel uh, cell carcinoma, that when you have these virally-driven tumors, that virus might cause transformation but is recognized by the immune system as foreign. And if we can stimulate the immune system, oftentimes these are the cancers that are most sensitive. And the problem with this hypothesis, though, is that to test everyone for EBV would probably be a couple thousand dollars a patient. We're only going to find it in about one out of 50 or 60 patients in, who have gastric cancer, and so it's probably not going to happen. But what we can do is just add to the 500 genes we're testing in that other assay a couple you know, of these biotinylated probes against DNA that's targeting EBV, and therefore, essentially for free, get the information as whether this is an EBV-driven tumor um, in, in, this, in any individual patient. So the incremental cost essentially um, becomes nothing. Um, we're also trying to get more information from each of these analyses. Um, we're trying to figure out, for example, with tumor suppressors like BRCA1 and 2, whether they've lost the wild-type copy of the gene in, in addition to having the mutation. We know in tumors where there's biallelic inactivation, they're more likely to respond to a PARP inhibitor, which is more effective in these BRCA-driven tumors. We are also looking for a signature of what's called microsatellite instability. Um, microsatellite instability also is kind of known as Lynch syndrome in, in some ways. Um, these are, uh, if you have a germline mutation in a certain uh, number of genes, you, you get this certain pattern of hypermutation and that causes uh, very frequent colon cancers and endometrial cancers, upper tract urothelial cancers, other cancer types. And what was recently shown was that when you have these hypermutated tumors, they're much more likely to respond to immunotherapy. And there was actually an FDA approval over the summer, um, pan cancer, that no matter what kind of cancer you have, if you've got a mismatch repair, MSI uh, positive tumor, um, you're now able to get this pembrolizumab uh, therapy, which sometimes takes patients that have advanced metastatic disease and cures them. It's really miraculous. Um, but the problem, again, is, is that there's no standard way to test for MSI, and patients that don't have endometrial or colon cancer are not routinely tested for this. And so the genetic analysis that we're doing can actually fairly easily um, pick this up. So this is a, a patient who's got esophageal gastric cancer, esophageal cancer, adenocarcinoma, they have 31 mutations out of 400 or so genes in their tumor. They have a mutation, which is their main driver, called KRAS, that unfortunately, after 30 years, we still haven't been able to develop a drug against that. But they also have a mutation in this protein called MLH1, which leads to this pattern of uh, mismatch repair deficiency. And they're act actually a Lynch syndrome patient. They don't have a germline mutation in MLH1. It's a somatic mutation. And so this patient went on to receive a, a drug called nivolumab, which is one of these immunotherapy drugs, and after about a year um, went on to have a, a complete response. And so um, w these are amazing responses, in, in essence, that when you don't have these MSI-type phenotypes, the likelihood of responding is about 2% to this drug. If you have this, it's about 
And these responses are not just transient. I mean, they are sometimes curative. And so right now, the dilemma in the US is that we've got these potentially curative drugs sitting there on the shelf. Most of the patients that have this, this particular genomic signature are dying without ever receiving these drugs because they're never even being um, tested. Um, this is actually a patient of mine with prostate cancer. Um, he had 23 alterations picked up by this assay. Um, we do other signature analysis I don't have time to go into, showing that this is sort of this mismatch repair deficient um, signature. I actually referred him to a phase one trial of one of these immunotherapies, a drug called tizolizumab. He also got this uh, second agent in combination. I'm not sure if that did much because it was a very early stage study. Um, and he went on to have a complete response. I mean, this was a, a gentleman um, who had already failed all the standard hormonal therapies um, and has now been two years complete response, possibly cured, and has been able to go off his hormone treatment. I've never actually seen that in 20 years, um, taking care of uh, patients like this at Sloan Kettering. It's probably actually the first patient with metastatic prostate cancer I've cured in 20 years um, because these patients are considered incurable, um, and this, this is probably cured. So this is about 3 to 4% of prostate cancers have this particular phenotype, and the drug, again, is now approved in anyone with that particular mutational signature but Medicare won't pay for the testing for this particular phenotype. Um, and actually, the FDA gave, gave no guidance as to how to actually look for um, this particular mutational signature. So I think what we're going to see is a very rapid ado adoption of this type of genetic testing in all the types of cancer, um, really driven by the need to identify these patients who are going to respond to, to immunotherapy. Um, there's other things we can actually get out of the normal, you know, analyzing the normal cells as part of this G DNA signature. Um, there's a condition called clonal hematopoiesis. And so if you just draw blood and then analyze, you know, people who are healthy otherwise for mutations, as you get older, you start to see that in the blood there are mutations. And some of those mutations are kind of scary genes, things like P53, very important tumor suppressor, that are present in people who don't have leukemia but they have a pre-malignant condition called clonal hematopoiesis. So they have some mutations, but probably not enough mutations to get leukemia, or maybe the mutations are occurring in a, a more differentiated cell that can't transform into a full-blooded um, leukemia. Um, but what we know is that if you have this clonal hematopoiesis and get chemotherapy, your likelihood of then getting leukemia um, after the chemotherapy is dramatically higher. And so we can get that information as sort of a byproduct of looking for these tumor-specific uh, mutations. The other thing, as I mentioned earlier, is we can look for these uh, mutations in genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2, and what we've learned is that these mutations, these germline mutations in, that are important for hereditary risk of these cancers are much more common than we thought just even two or three um, years ago, and at least in our initial experience, about 15% of all patients that we've done the genetic testing on have had a specific mutation that increase their heritable risk of getting cancer. And this obviously has a lot of implications for their family members who also could have the same exact mutation um, because this is in the normal cells. And this, I just wanna highlight this, this is BRCA2. This is named BRCA2 because it's breast cancer inheritable gene number two that was identified um, right after BRCA1. And what's notable about our analysis, and this is a heat map um, where the darker colors are a higher prevalence of mutations in that gene, um, the, the likelihood of having a, a germline BRCA2 mutation is actually higher in patients with pancreas and prostate cancer in our data set than ovarian and breast cancer, where these mutations are typically um, you know, associated. And that was quite surprising to us. And it, it relates to the bias of this data set in that our patients are advanced metastatic patients, and these mutations correlate with bad prostate cancer versus sort of lower grade prostate cancer. So this is kind of the, the future where probably we're all gonna, we probably all have about five to 10 heritable trait mutations within our genome that make us increase risk of something, either heart disease, you know, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Um, one of the genes in the, in the assay is called PARC2, and the reason it's called Parkinson2 gene is that it's associated with increased heritable risk of Parkinson and, and Parkinson's disease. And the question is, do you really want to know these things? And really, one of the main dilemmas as we've rolled out these, this program, and really the only institution doing this to scale right now for this reason, is that there's still a lot of concern that when you identify these mutations, they then become a, a pre-existing condition. And so if all the you know, teenagers and 20-year-olds in this country now know they do or do not have these mutations, they all may be uninsurable at some point in the future for health insurance um, unless we sort of tighten up 
you know, laws to make it impossible to discriminate against people with, with particular pre-existing conditions. And it's a big fear that if the Affordable Care Act is actually, you know, repealed in its entirety, um, these patients, and 15% of the population, again, and we're only looking at just for a few genes, essentially we're all uninsurable because we all have some pre-existing condition. And so it just becomes something that, that inevitably we're going to have to figure out um, legally what's, you know, how to deal with this. Um, but we actually just are scratching the surface. We don't really understand um, this topic uh, much at all. And I just want to show two prostate patients which really highlight that. Um, it's actually a gentleman with prostate cancer who has one of these germline mutations in BRCA2. He was diagnosed young at 48, he's now 59. And it's probably not surprising that he has a BRCA2 mutation because he has a sister with breast cancer, another sister with ovarian. He actually has two uncles with breast cancer, which is rare, you know, to see male breast cancer. Here's an aunt with breast cancer, another aunt with breast cancer. So this guy's got a sort of a breast, you know, cancer, ovarian cancer syndrome family, and he probably should have been tested. And this is obviously gonna be of great interest to his daughter as to whether she inherited that allele or didn't inherit that allele. And she's got a 50% chance of inheriting this, this germline BRCA mutation. But this guy here, who's not Jewish, and these mutations are obviously higher in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, he's Irish Catholic. Um, this guy has the exact same mutation as this guy, who had prostate cancer diagnosed at 57. He's now 73. He's got three daughters, um, 44 through 51, um, none of whom have had breast and ovarian cancer. You don't really see anything in the aunts and uncles, but maybe it's just because he's got a smaller family. Um, he even has a granddaughter who's 21 um, who could have that same inheritable risk. And so why did this family not have a high penetrance of these, uh, these tumor types, whereas the other one did? Um, maybe there's secondary or tertiary mutations that are actually protective in this family, or maybe it's the flip around. Maybe there is actually co-mutations that, that synergize with the BRCA2 mutation in this family that make them particularly at risk um, for, for such a high penetrance of the gene. Um, I just wanted to point this out. I'm not going to show any data. This paper published in Science last week um, showing that if you actually look at the normal HLA alleles, um, that's also predictive of response to immunotherapy. So what we're learning is, is that if you've got more diversity of your HLA alleles, you're more likely to present a more diverse range of neoantigens that might make these immunotherapies more effective um, in those uh, patients. So, we still, though, sequence patients with this assay. Again, we're looking at all the known cancer genes, all the known knowns, and this is a patient with adrenal cortical cancer. We ran our assay, and we found absolutely no mutations, um, zero. Um, so we actually have a, a, tr a project that, that sort of tries to tackle these sort of unknown cases where we use whole genome or exome sequencing um, to solve them. So this patient went to exome sequencing, and we use informatics to figure out what is likely important. And 26 of these mutations looked like passengers. This is the one that jumped out, the ZNRF3, because this paper had just been published that if you take a bunch of adrenal cortical cancers and then statistically look at what's most commonly mutated, it's this protein nobody knew about called ZNRF3. And um, it, it turns out that it could be an E3 ubiquitin ligase and thus important as a, a tumor suppressor. So this was an unknown cancer gene as of a year and a half ago. In the new assay, version four of our assay, this, this gene will now be included based upon this project. Um, this case is actually a little more interesting from a therapeutic standpoint. It was a melanoma. Um, this TERP mutation is a functional mutation, but not enough to get a cancer. The rest of these are all predicted to be passengers. If you do exome sequencing in this patient, you now have 392 mutations, which again, 391 of them seem to be passengers, and we still seem to be missing something based upon our understanding of melanoma biology. So remember, we're just looking at the DNA here. The, these type of techniques, in particular, misfusions, um, so we used a, an RNA-based technique called Archer Fusion um, to look for any fusions we may have missed here, and this patient turned out to have an ETV6 NTRAC3 fusion. So this is a kinase, this protein called NTRAC, and this is a transcription factor. And this had just been described as a functional set of fusions. No one had ever identified a melanoma patient with this fusion, but we just had a basket study open that targets this uh, fusion. And so here is this patient, um, her melanoma started on her foot. She's got all of these in-transit metastases. She'd already failed all the standard immunotherapies and other drugs. She's got disease in her visceral region. And within two months of going on this drug, she's gone on to have a, a complete response, which is now about 16 months out. And this drug was sort of the toast of ASCO this past year. The response rate of this drug um, in pediatric patients has been 14 out of 15 patients. And in adult patients, it's about 90%. But the main issue with this drug is this, this fusion is probably no more than maybe one in 1,500 patients with cancer, and it's not in any one particular cancer, common cancer type. 
more than, say, one in a thousand. Um, and so you have to screen everyone to find these occasional um, N-track fusions. And so is the technology there to do that? We can do it at Sloan Kettering, but most patients are not getting um, that tested. Um, we're trying to reach out beyond Sloan Kettering. One of the problems with our population is, is that it's kind of uh, not particularly diverse. Um, Upper East Side of Manhattan is where we're based. I mean, we draw from all, you know, the, the entire region, but um, we've tried to reach out with, with an effort called Impacted. Um, so this is Impact and Racial Disparities, where we're now offering this free testing, um, not just to people at Memorial, but to people who come to two of the, uh, uh, the city-based hospitals, the King, Kings and Queens County, as well as this Ralph Lawrence Center in Harlem. And it's very possible that we'll learn a lot about this in terms of differences in mutation patterns in certain ethnic racial groups that they really are not the same. And we already know that, for example, with EGFR mutations, which is now one of the targetable um, uh, kinase uh, mutations, that, for example, Asian women have a 70% likelihood of having an EGFR mutation. If you take a Caucasian smoker male, it's about 2%. And so there really are major ethnic differences in, in, in these mutations. Um, this Make an Impact program actually was inspired by my daughter's history. My daughter, unfortunately, um, was diagnosed with cancer as a high school senior um, two years ago. She was diagnosed with a very rare cancer called an ovarian germ cell tumor. And this cancer is so rare that we see about four of them at Sloan Kettering a year. Um, and, you know, we're the big referral center um, in the area. So it's, it's quite curable, and she's doing well. She's now a sophomore at Penn uh, as an undergrad, and, but had to go through lots of chemotherapy, you know, a whole bunch of different surgeries. Um, but no one had ever studied this, this cancer um, because it's so rare. You can't even get enough tumors together in a cohort to, to do an analysis. And so we came up with the idea, you know, why restrict our analysis to just patients who are coming to see us? It's 2017, you know, we got the internet, we got social media. You know, why not reach out to patients anywhere in the world who might have what you're looking to study and ask them to volunteer to participate in your program? And so um, we raised money through a, a group called Cycle for Survival um, and then began offering this test to anyone in the world who has this particular uh, tumor type. And we've been able to recruit patients from all over the world, you know, South America, Australia, UK, you know, uh, Europe, uh, Canada, um, and we've already gotten about 50 patients with this rare cancer. It would probably have taken us 25 years to wait for those patients to come to our hospital. Um, we've gotten 50 patients um, within about a year um, using this program. Um, we've opened it up to a few other rare type of cancers since then. Again, we can't do this for breast cancer because we don't have the capacity to sequence the world's breast cancers. Um, but we opened it up to a rare tumor type called mammary secretory carcinoma of the breast. The reason we did this, there's probably 15 cases of this cancer in the U.S. alone, or the U.S. Uh, every year, uh, maybe a bit more uh, internationally. But the reason we thought this was interesting is that 95% of these cancers have a fusion in NTRAC, the, the thing I just showed you um, in that melanoma patient for which we've got this new drug that seems to work in every single patient who we give it to. And so we put out this call through social media. Um, if you've got a mammary secretory carcinoma, you're anywhere in the world we will sequence your tumor for free, and hopefully if you've got an NTRAC fusion, we'll try to match you up with, with the drug. And so this is actually the first person who, who took us up on this offer. This is actually uh, a 12-year-old girl from Bangladesh um, who was initially diagnosed um, at eight. And so she, you know, prepubescent girl, developed breast cancer. And so she got this tumor on her breast. She went, you know, she actually lives in a village, doesn't even have routine electricity, goes to the big town where they got a hospital, they try to cut this tumor out, and it was smaller initially, and unfortunately it came back, they cut it out again, it came back. It's now this big fungating tumor on her chest, and it's metastatic to bones and things like that. So we actually, through colleagues, through social media, were able to find out about this patient. We offered her the free testing. We got the Bangladeshi doctors to send us her tumor and, and normal sample of blood. Um, we sequenced it, she has an NTRAC fusion, and then more miraculously, we were able to convince the company to actually fly her from Bangladesh to New York City. We put her up at the Ronald McDonald House on 73rd Street and then gave her this drug as a single patient exemption from the FDA, um, and she's gone on to have a complete response. She's been on for about 16 months. But what's amazing to me is we actually got this girl from Bangladesh, and actually most of the kids in, in the Bronx and Brooklyn that have these tumors or other tumors, pediatric, are not getting tested at all. So I think we're still, you know, it's a pretty amazing story, but, but we're still sh falling short um, and offering this technology broadly. There's a huge amount of disparity um, into who's able to access this right now or not. 
One of the problems we have is it's still hard to get the tumor from patients. Um, there are many patients. We don't have the tumor to sequence. Um, they didn't have a big surgery and a big mass that was cut out. Maybe it was a small little uh, biopsy. And to get over that, and this is the last part of the talk, um, we've actually learned that when the tumors grow, they actually sometimes shed DNA into the plasma. And that as the technology's gotten more sensitive and powerful, we can actually detect this tumor DNA in the bloodstream. And so the case that really, I think, highlights why we need this technology yesterday, not tomorrow, is actually this patient we had um, who had a cancer of unknown primary. So this was a, a young gentleman, um, 27 years old, who was referred to us. He had widely metastatic disease. They had done a biopsy at the outside hospital, which suggested he had a germ cell tumor, which is kind of what you hope it is if it's a widely metastatic uh, cancer in a young man, because we sometimes cure those, even if they're metastatic to brain, which is what Lance um, Armstrong had. Um, it was a bad biopsy, but he had a pneumothorax, which means they had a collapse of the lung when they did the biopsy, and he didn't want to undergo another biopsy. Um, so we looked at it. We weren't really sure what it was. Uh, maybe it was a germ cell tumor. We collected some blood from him from the cell, for the cell-free DNA project at, at one of the initial visits, but we gave him the chemotherapy, hoping it was a germ cell tumor. We tried to do impact on this crappy fine-needle aspirate, and unfortunately, it failed. And so we couldn't do the sequencing. Um, about two months later, and I'm going in the wrong direction here, um, we transferred the, the cell-free sample to our research lab. Again, we weren't doing this in clinical time, hadn't optimized an assay for cell-free yet. And about a week after that, he progressed, and then we did a liver biopsy, which he finally agreed to because it had spread to someplace more accessible. And unfortunately, he didn't have a germ cell tumor. He had an adenocarcinoma. And unfortunately, that's why he didn't respond to the chemo. And then about three weeks later, he died. It was about three months after he was initially diagnosed. And then about two weeks after he died, this cell-free analysis came back. And it turns out that he had an EML4 alk fusion. This is a fusion for which we have a good set of drugs that usually work for years. And so essentially, the system let this guy down. And so you know, in my initial sort of slides, I was telling you, you know, our goal is to solve the molecular driver in every single patient's cancer. For this guy, we weren't able to solve it until after he died. Um, we'll be done with our work when, when these cases don't happen. But by analyzing the tumor, it's inherently difficult to get enough DNA for some patients because their disease is very inaccessible. Um, or maybe it was collected at another hospital in a poor way. Um, but if we could just draw their blood and get the tumor DNA, that really solves a lot of those problems. And so we have an assay that, that's going to be doing that. It uses what's called error suppression. I don't really have time to talk about it, but we can talk about people afterwards. afterwards. And we hope to roll this out um, in the next few months. And um, this will allow us to you know, not just sort of do a one-time assay on these patients where we're looking for these mutations. We could also now serially maybe look over time and see if new mutations are arising dynamically in patients that are causing drug resistance and maybe act on that um, to, to overcome uh, the, the, that drug resistance. So I'll just leave the conclusion, just acknowledge a lot of people. Um, you know, this has been a work of, of a couple hundred people at Sloan Kettering, um, including Mike Berger, who developed the MSK Impact assay we run. Barry's our um, computational guy. We've actually created what we think is an entirely new field that we call computational oncology. And so what we found is that a lot of the computational biologists are just not that interested in the more translational aspects of what we're trying to do. Um, sometimes the computational things we're doing are not novel from a computational standpoint. They're just running the same type of you know, analysis again and again. The novelty might be in the biology, or the novelty is in the, uh, on the clinical aspect or importance of that analysis. And so we've created kind of a new field, computational oncology, of people we hope are going to be interested in not just the computational methods, but also that, that clinical or biologic aspect of it. Um, Anius runs the core. Mark actually developed uh, with Mike the, the clinical assay and runs the clinical program. Um, the medical genetics keep people are key. There's an ongoing battle in my field um, from the tumor geneticists versus the medical geneticists who do the germline. Um, the tumor geneticists want this information immediately to help our the patients um, now because they might be dying of cancer. The medical geneticists are worried about inheritable risk and you know, whether this information you know, is something that all family members want to know about. I mean, if you're 20 years old, do you really want to know about the eight things you might be at increased risk for, some of which you have a 30% penetrance to, to potentially get? And so we're constantly battling with these guys, but in a good way. Um, and then we sort of collaborate with all our clinical colleagues, um, really, who, who help us, and obviously thank our patients who participate um, in our studies, and, and thanks for the invitation. Yeah.